We're planting kale, cabbage, some bok choy, and a few Brussels sprout plants. That and a whole lot more coming up today on the Wisconsin Vegetable Garden. funded by the following. At dollarseed.com, all of our seeds are only a dollar a pack. And we have online resources that teach you all about the rewarding hobby of growing your own plants, flowers, herbs, and vegetables. Imagine the joy you'll feel when your children actually help you harvest your first garden crop, or the pride of knowing you'll never need a florist again. Visit dollarseed.com and grow a little magic of your own for just a dollar. Dollarseed.com. What could be healthier? Willow Spring Soap Company is a locally owned Colorado business just a stone's throw away from the Rocky Mountains. Their handmade soap is made from simple, recognizable ingredients, which lead to a more natural, earth-friendly, long-lasting, and hard bar with a wonderful creamy lather. They make soap using the cold kettle process with a specially formulated recipe of 100% vegetable oils. They use traditional methods that produce a true soap instead of the commercial synthetic alternatives that can dry out skin. Go to www.willowspringsoap.com to get a fresh and natural clean handmade in the Rockies. No matter where you live, you can compost year-round with the Worm Factory 360. It requires very little maintenance. As of 2010, the Worm Factory 360 is the only self-sorting worm composter made in the USA. Made with high-quality food-grade recyclable plastic with a 20-year limited warranty. For more information on how to purchase your own Worm Factory 360, visit www.lvworms.com. The Wisconsin Vegetable Gardener supports the following. Hunger Task Force believes that every person has the right to adequate food obtained with dignity. They're providing food for people in need. With their 151-acre working farm and fish hatchery in Franklin, Wisconsin, volunteers are needed daily. You could plant seeds in the greenhouse, ride the transplant, or you can make an instant $10 donation from your mobile device by texting FOOD to 52000. For more information on how you can help in hunger, visit HungerTaskForce.org. Welcome to the Wisconsin Vegetable Gardener. I'm Joy Baird. This show is dedicated to the average gardener, simple home living, and using what you already have. Well, today we're going to plant some cool weather crops. We're going to plant some kale, some cup of Brussels sprouts, and some bok choy, and even some cabbage. Now we're going to start over here in the new portion of the garden in front of the house. Now there's a questions I've been asked. How do you go about starting a garden when you haven't had a garden? Well, there's a couple things you can do. You can flip the soil over and just spade it, or you can take the grass off of it, put that in your compost bin, and then spade it then. But we're just gonna spade it and flip the soil over and put the grass in the bottom. So let me get started with that, and then we'll get to planting, prepping the soil and then planting our cool weather crops. So I've almost got this little square here spaded up and I noticed something about it. There is a lot of earthworms in this soil and that is an absolutely great thing because earthworms they do a lot of good for the, the, the ground. They aerate the soil, they break down compost, they break down organic matter and the more worms you have in your garden the better off you are. But we are going to add a little uh, organic matter to this uh, some nitrogen as in the form of coffee grounds just to give this soil a little more of a kick. So let me finish spading this here and there's two types of soil we've got going on. Right along this fence it's very airy soil and over more out in the yard it's more of a dense soil. But over time that that will break down and it's cloudy too and we're going to take the hole and kind of break that soil up. I wouldn't recommend running the tiller over this unless that's the only uh, possible way of flipping the soil. So now we got that all done and there's going to be some grass that comes up and we'll just pull that out as we go. Alright, I'm taking the hole here and just trying to knock down the big chunks 
And if you see a wad of soil here, or of uh, grass, you get that worm out of there, you just kick that to the side and just kind of work the, uh, there's a big clump of grass I want out, work the uh, clods out of it. And then after we do that, I'm gonna take uh, my handmade three-pronged rake and add some coffee grounds to the soil and then we'll get our seedlings in the ground. All right, that looks pretty good. I got a few earthworms on top, it's not a big deal. Now we're gonna throw a little coffee grounds on top of the soil. Now if you get, if you have coffee grounds and you wanna save them, that's fine. Or you can go to your local uh, coffee shop and they will, if you request, they more likely will save them for you because they just go in the landfill anyway. And they'll just give you a full garbage bag full or sometimes they request a five gallon bucket with your name on it and they'll call you when it's full. And they'll throw the filters in as well because they just dump the coffee gra ground out. Now you can leave the filters and just throw the filters because they're biodegradable. I don't like that because it just, there's too many things that can blow around. Looks kind of, uh, in the urban setting, it just doesn't look very nice but I will put them in the compost bin there. So I'm just going to uh, take and shake just a little coffee grounds, not much, because I don't want to overpower the soil. I just want to give it a little kick. And you're going to get your hands dirty, but it's fine. Now this is going to add several things to the soil. It's going to add nitrogen. It's going to add phosphates. It's going to add calcium. And that's everything your plant really needs to get going. So now that we've done that, let me take the little hole here, or the little rake, and just kind of mix it in just slightly. And then we'll get planting our starts here. Now, <coughs> now these starts here, we've got Brussels sprouts, we've got kale, cabbage, and bok choy. And we start these from seed. So we're going to go ahead and start with the kale first. And because it's kind of cold, kale will withstand temperatures as of 20 degrees Fahrenheit. Now it's supposed to be about 38, 39 tonight, but I am going to cover them with soda bottles just to help them out. And the spacing on the kale, if you remember what a kale looks like, it's gonna be about 12 to 14 inches in diameter, a good, for a good healthy plant. So we're going to tighten them up a little bit instead of giving them a gap of about eight inches, we're going to put them together about six inches or, or a little tighter. So basically when they mature, they'll brush leaves to maximize my space. All right, now we're gonna get these kale plants in the ground. So I'm gonna come off the fence about 12 inches there. Just make a little hole. And I wanna break up where that little uh, plant's gonna go. I really wanna get that mulched really nicely just so it has a better chance of starting. So we've got our little marker here. Now the best way to get these out of the start, if you have one of these little cell plants that you started yourself, I'm using a window blind. The back of a spoon works real well. Just pinch the bottom and it will come, shoot fall right out. There we go. I'm just gonna put that in the ground. Cover them up. Now there's a couple ways of protecting your plants. Um, use a juice bottle, cut the bottom off, or a soda bottle, one liter, two liter, three liter, either one of those will work well. And if you don't have that option and it's gonna be a cold night, you can just take uh, your a plastic container such as a pot here and just set over top of the plant for the night just to protect it and it'll stay a little bit warmer in there and actually save the plant. We're gonna use soda bottles and we're gonna loosen the tops on them We'll push this down in the soil a little bit. We got a rock there. We're gonna loosen the tops on them a little bit to let some air circulate through. I don't wanna take the top off. I've heard people recommend getting that top off so the air circulates. I wanna keep the top on at least for tonight. And then tomorrow I'll take the top off and allow the plant to, to breathe a little bit more. So we'll put that marker there. We actually use for our container. So let me get the rest of these planted and then we'll move on to some bok choy some cabbage, and a few Brussels sprouts. The three kale planted there. Now we're gonna start more and we'll uh, put them in the garden after they come up. We're gonna plant some Brussels sprouts. We've got two of them here. 
And Brussels sprouts get quite large, but I'm going to kind of take the chance of putting them in a little tighter than normal, just to uh, save a little space. Now, if your kids don't like Brussels sprouts, store-bought ones, that is, grow some of your own. There is a total difference in the taste of store-bought Brussels sprouts and home-grown Brussels sprouts. Now, these Brussels sprouts will get about uh, almost three foot tall, healthy ones will, and then they'll bush out to 18, 20 inches, and they'll be just loaded with little Brussels sprouts. So I'm gonna cover this one for the night. I'm gonna take the top and loosen a little bit. We got one more back here, and then the fence will kind of help this one out, being right here. Get that started. Now we're gonna get our cabbage and our bok choy started. So we're gonna get our bok choy planted here between the Brussels sprouts and the kale. And I know what you're thinking, wait a minute, isn't that all gonna be, is, isn't that gonna be uh, uh, no room there? Well, the bok choy will mature much quicker than the Brussels sprouts and the kale will. So it, it'll, also, it'll work fine there. Also, if you wanted to plant, let's say radishes between each one of these rows, that would work as well too, because radishes will mature between 22 and 33 days and you can harvest them before your uh, other cool weather plants get to the mature state and uh, shade them out. So we're just gonna drop these in. I'm going to put a little protection around. These are just, uh, well, they're not soup cans, they're little juice, metal juice containers that work real good for placing around the plants. And I'm gonna put that one, I'm gonna, since I got room, I'm gonna put it back here. And we're going to then put our cabbage in the ground to get our cool weather garden started. So let me get this here. All right, now let's do our cabbage. Okay, so we're going to uh, move the kneeling pad over here. And cabbage is an, a, a wonderful plant to grow. I encourage you to grow it. You can make all kinds of great things with it, especially freezer slaw uh, that we made a ton of last year. So we'll put that there, get our soda bottle around it for the night, put our other one here. And if you have starts, that's fine too. Um, any, it'll work just as well. So there we go, we got the beginning portions of our cool, cool weather garden started and we'll progress down through the garden and continue to plant until we're all done. We're in the barn today getting the items out of storage that we use in our garden, mainly trellises and tomato cages to see which ones we need to repair and which ones we can upgrade to make them work a little bit better this year in the garden. Now all of us have tomato cages and if you don't you need to get some because you've got to get your tomatoes up off the ground. Uh, our to all the tomato cages they are welded. You get your uh, tall stakes and then you have welds around. Typically sometimes the welds will break. Well what you can do is take a damaged one whether damaged by you or someone you love, and you can take and cut portions off of the damaged tomato cage and wrap around the portion that the weld has busted. And that's virtually almost as sturdy as brand new. You can also do it with smaller tomato cages too. Uh, these with the heavier great uh, gauge wire. Now we tried this last year, uh, taking the leg and just wrapping around the, the lower ring. That didn't work so well and the ring has busted now, so this will be portioned off as a uh, repair material. You can also take the little ones uh, to make occasion. Now we found this, why somebody has cut the top, the bottom off of it, I don't know. But you could take and be creative and put two of them together to get a little more extension out of it and run a fence post down the center if that's the only option you have. So that's one thing you can do with the tomato cages is look through them and see which ones you need to repair. Now on the trellises, you can also do the same thing. We've got several trellises in the back here. Now this is off the bottom of a baby crib. This is what the mattress sits on. These work great for anything that climbs. Now you want to kind of look to see if everything's still intact to the framework. Well up here, uh, we're missing one brace and this one here the spring's gone so this will be the top now instead of the bottom to give the plant ample growth capabilities of clawing up it's still functional and if you need more growth you could get another one and go higher with it uh, also the side of a baby crib works excellent for a trellis you can take both sides and you can extend it up eight eight foot or so and then i zip tie and put a fence post couple fence posts behind it worked really well 
Now, to help the plants grasp onto the trellis, you could take what we've used here, which is fan grate, off a box fan and attach it with zip ties. You could also take jute rope, rope or nylon rope, and run it vertical to allow and tie it to the top and the bottom of your trellis to allow the plants to have some uh, grasping capability to uh, crawl up better. Another thing you can use is chicken wire. Uh, they're very inexpensive at your hardware store, and you can run that on any type of trellis. Uh, for example, this one here that the uh, father-in-law gave me, he was using it, going to use it as a project and never materialized. So this is something that uh, somebody put in their flower bed more likely that I can use now in the vegetable garden, and I could take and run chicken wire. Uh, the chicken wire is actually you know, just about the right width, and I could run chicken wire up and uh, up and down it zip tied or wired, and I could use this for any type of item that will grow in the garden that's going to grow on a trellis. Cucumbers, uh, for the main example. Uh, pole beans work also uh, very well with that. Also, you've seen these trellises, these white ones, it's the fan that uh, some people use for rose bushes. Well, you can convert that into a vegetable trellis with uh, either chicken wire, or we found this wire, uh, rubber coated wire, and a giant spool, and we've expanded that across the trellis and zip tied a fence post to it, and it works very well for spaghetti squash or even gourds. And if you need more extension height, you can take and put the another roll of wire up a little higher, and you can actually extend the fence post. You can get fence posts eight uh, eight foot in height, and you can run up the entire length. So just some things that you need to look at before you start going in the garden and putting these items in. And like I've always said, a trellis doesn't have to be pretty, it just has to be functional. There's many different ways to store your garden tools, whether before, during, or after the gardening season. You can spend a, 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 consider, a considerable amount of money and purchase a very nice tool rack at your local home and garden center. You can hang them on the wall in your garage. Or you can make a simple tool rack out of simple of items you probably already have laying around the house. This, this was a tool rack we constructed out of lumber that we found. Uh, this is zero expense to us. These are some one by sixes that I picked up, uh, apparently from off a deck, I would think. And we just constructed a square to store our tools. We put holes in the top with the diameter of each tool that we wanted to store. And at the base, we have holes or little indentions to where the tools can kind of set instead of sliding around. Also, in the base, uh, to add more structure stability, we put the base of a floor lamp uh, that we just screwed to the bottom, and that adds a lot more stability than just having this board on the ground. Now, we could extend this tool rack out to double its size by placing another 1x6 about a foot away from the current structure because if we put it too close, the tools would hit each other and they wouldn't set into their uh, assigned spot that, uh, that good. So we'd extend it out and put another one by six over here. Also on the sides, you can add more storage by uh, attaching PVC pipe. We've got our shears and our bow saw hanging there. You could also attach hooks or nails and hang tools from that. And as you may have guessed, all these tools we have found uh, most of them were just simple or minor repairs that most of us could do to save some money. Broken handles, for example. On the back of our tool rack, we have a brace. And it's very important to have a brace to structurally so uh, make this structurally sound. Otherwise, it would want to sway back and forth. So that's important. So you don't have to spend a lot of money, if anything at all, to create a tool rack, no matter where you're storing it. Even with some 2x4s, 2x6s, or whatever you have laying around that you can make your own tool rack to store your tools during this gardening season. Double digging, that's what I'm doing here. Now what is double digging? Well, it's digging twice. Well, sort of. What you're doing, gonna do is take a spade or a dirt shovel, and you're just gonna go into the garden wherever the soil is extremely dense, and you want to do this across your whole garden whenever you have the time. But you'll go down until the shovel won't go down anymore. Now don't jump on it, but that's, that's as far down as you want to go. Take that soil and flip it to the side. Then you'll shovel out everything that's in this specific row that you're doing. 
And as you can see now, where I've got dug before is, this is all good topsoil here. Down here is where that clay soil begins to uh, start to form. Now most people will go into their garden with a tiller and just rototill everything until the soil is nice and fluffy. Well, you're, you're doing, not doing the best thing by doing that because when you rototill, you're just taking everything and mixing it together. When you double dig, you're removing the top layer of soil, the top soil, which is the good nutritional, good nutritional and you're leaving the clay or the more dense soil. Now once you've got the trench dug, then you want to take a spade or a, a flat tine board and you want to come in here and you're not actually going to pull this soil out. You're just, you're going to get on there, work this, work it down and then flip you gotta be careful so you don't break your fork because it's very dense soil. Had a root there. And you're just gonna go down there. Ah, there we go. And all you're doing is just taking and loosening that, that clay or that more dense soil up. Now what's the benefit to this? It gets more air into the soil, more oxygen, which is what plants need. Also it allows water to drain better through your soil and allows root penetration to go farther down into your soil. Now after you've done this row, what you do is you progress through the garden by doing this. So you start over here and just flip the soil over to where we've already double dug. And you're, it's going to be difficult at times because it's, it's going to want to fall back on you. Then you just flip it over down to where the shovel wouldn't go anymore. Take your pitchfork, get in there, aerate it up. And you can do this throughout the garden. Now this is not something you'd want to do every year, but probably every three to five years you'd want to do this. Instead of rototilling and mixing all the soil up, you're keeping the good nutritious soil on top, but aerating the soil underneath that is more dense. Last summer in the front yard here, we had a container garden. Well, this year we wanted to expand our growing space to approximately 200 square feet. But by law, we had to call Digger's Hotline. So we marked up the area and have him, had him come and mark to see what was under the soil. Well, as you can see by the number of flags in the front yard, there was more there than what we had anticipated for. We've got cable lines, buried gas lines, and even buried electrical lines in our front yard. So since we can't dig here, we can still modify and have a garden in the front yard by moving our garden from 200 square feet to approximately 90 square feet, keeping away from the buried lines. And we can also maximize our fence by using it to place small vining plants such as cucumbers in it or on it and use that as a trellis. So before you dig as putting a garden in your front yard or even putting a post with some decorative flowers on it, you need to call because if we would have dug here, one, we may would have got injured or caused death, and two, hefty fines would have been issued on us. So with a small garden, we can still have the items that we wanted to have, just more consolidated, such as the square foot gardening method. We can have onions and peppers, tomatoes, cucumbers, and even some zucchini. So before you dig, be sure you call so you know what's under your soil. Well, that's all the time we have. Hope you enjoyed the show as much as we enjoyed bringing it to you. And as you can see, it doesn't take much effort to start a small garden plot in your yard. And I encourage you to do it. The average American meal travels 1,500 miles from field to table. Now's the year to break that down to about 1,500 feet. And get those trellises and tomato cages out of storage and be sure you're ready to go when it's time to plant them items. For all of us here at the Wisconsin Vegetable Gardener, I'm Joy Berry encouraging you Take a child gardening and start growing some memories. This program was funded by the following. At dollarseed.com, all of our seeds are only a dollar a pack. And we have online resources that teach you all about the rewarding hobby of growing your own plants, flowers, herbs, and vegetables. Imagine the joy you'll feel when your children actually help you harvest your first garden crop. Or the pride of knowing you'll never need a florist again. Visit dollarseed.com 
and grow a little magic of your own for just a dollar. DollarSeed.com. What could be healthier? Willow Spring Soap Company is a locally owned Colorado business just a stone's throw away from the Rocky Mountains. Their handmade soap is made from simple, recognizable ingredients, which lead to a more natural, earth-friendly, long-lasting, and hard bar with a wonderful creamy lather. They make soap using the cold kettle process with a specially formulated recipe of 100% vegetable oils. They use traditional methods that produce a true soap instead of the commercial synthetic alternatives that can dry out skin. Go to www.willowspringsoap.com to get a fresh and natural clean handmade in the Rockies. No matter where you live, you can compost year-round with the Worm Factory 360. It requires very little maintenance. As of 2010, the Worm Factory 360 is the only self-sorting worm composter made in the USA. Made with high-quality food-grade recyclable plastic with a 20-year limited warranty. For more information on how to purchase your own Worm Factory 360, visit www.lvworms.com. The Wisconsin Vegetable Gardener supports the following. Hunger Task Force believes that every person has the right to adequate food obtained with dignity. They're providing food for people in need. With their 151-acre working farm and fish hatchery in Franklin, Wisconsin, volunteers are needed daily. You could plant seeds in the greenhouse, ride the transplant, or you can make an instant $10 donation from your mobile device by texting FOOD to 52000. For more information on how you can help in hunger, visit HungerTaskForce.org. The show never ends on our Facebook page. Keyword, Wisconsin Vegetable Gardeners. Like the page and continue the discussion there. You can now follow us on Twitter. See what we're up to and what we're doing at the garden. The address, the W-I, Veg Gardener, G-A-R-D-E-N-R. You can email us at the W-I, Veg Gardener, at gmail.com with your questions, comments, or suggestions about the show.